Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Magic Mike's. Proudly sponsored by our Patreon supporters and CoolStuffInc.com, where you can find cool stuff in stock every day, and our co-sponsor CardHoarder.com, offering the best inventory prices and delivery of cards for Magic Online. I am Evan Irwin, and we get started each week by saying hello by two co-hosts, Aaron Campbell. Hey, everybody. Ruben Bressler. Hi, what's up? We are on brand new technology. We are. Because Skype sucks, and changed everything and i can't do i can't make the show like i was able to make the show so hey zoom.us you got a new customer because Great. you can show me people in windows and i can't yep. do that with any other service so we're also available for sponsorship opportunities zoom so if you want to if you want right. to work something out we got you we got you we got it we got a little bit of a viewership a little bit of a following a small yep. for your much. when skype breaks needs there's zoom.us <laughs> that's right uh and i believe it was as Ruben W, it's the RC Cola of. This is uh, of off Jack brand on. Skype. Yeah, we're. Yeah. It's not great. It's, it's not. No, it's, it's not. fine. It's perfectly serviceable. In fact, it's exactly sure. what we're looking for. Audio may be a little wonky here and there, but I think that's the yeah. only drawback I can see of the service right it's now. Like but it's like buying functional. It's like instead of buying Cheerios, you buy Weedios. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And then you pour them back in the box of the Cheerios, <laughs> and the kids just never know the difference. And, and the overlay like, is the box. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is what you're saying. It's fantastic. Yeah. So. We also get started with our Trumpet Blast, which you can get one if you support us at our highest level on Patreon. Don't have one this week. However, we kick it off with our first pick and giveaway, which is, of course, a $50 gift certificate to CoolStuffInc.com because I am an original person with original <laughs> ideas. And, uh, and Aaron can help me fulfill that, which is good. All right. So we are going to the first pick. We're going to the Hall of Fame drama. Wait a minute directly to the red zone ladies and gentlemen yeah. for the first time ever the first pick goes straight to the red zone <laughs> we have hall of fame ballots we got hall of fame drama we got people talking mm. snack uh, talking smack in front of people's mamas i like it's, talking snack that's way better <laughs> talking <laughs> snack talking like sandwich um but yeah there happens to be someone missing on both of your all's ballots now aaron you get the pass it's cool right you know <laughs> You know, why, wait, why got, does she get the pass? Because she's more or less, she's way newer to the game than we are. We have a whole, <laughs> from the 90s up, this is like the de defined part of our childhood slash adolescence, and you're telling me that Chris Pakula is not on your list. On the ballot, I released today, his name has absolutely been on there. He deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. This is about honoring people who like first of all he missed again by one vote let's recall this he missed by one vote it's not like he, they didn't want him in it's just that he barely missed and then you know close after close after close it just and it doesn't look like he's going to get in this year or it's going to be a nail biter either way which means it's important that you guys who now have a voice vote for him reuben tell yeah, us how wrong that's you are. fine mm -hmm. i get that do you but you're wrong. I hate you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Look, I probably would have voted for Chris Pakula 10 years ago. I might have voted for him five years ago. But we got this log jam now of worthy candidates mm -hmm. with four Pro Tour top eights bare minimum already. My 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 lowest bar of, of entry, the lowest barrier for entry for me step one the first hurdle you got across oh, is here we go four pro tour top eights oh, you can't that's, that's not how it works or three with a win mm -hmm. or three with another big win of some kind like a team worlds or something like that mm -hmm. that's how that's how i cut it down now if you meet all the other bars great but for example i wouldn't have voted for uh randy bueller the year he got in uh, or Patrick Chapin when he got in because they had three Pro Tour top eights with no other big wins. Wow. It would have happened That's afterwards, just, probably. That is just such a – look, man, you, obviously you can have all over criteria you like, but that being like your absolute number one bar, you, yeah. you, can, you, you cannot one. pass. It's not, the hall, it's not the Hall of Very Good, Evan. It's the Hall no, of Fame. No, it it's is the Hall of Fame. It is someone who is literally famous – for helping to get rid of cheating and to make things more respectable, to get this judge program in line, to get people to stop just And you're saying the other candidates them. aren't? No, of course not. Like what I'm, I'm not gonna vote I'm not voting for a metaphor here. I'm not voting for symbolism. I'm voting for people who I think are the people who should be in the Hall of Fame. 
that's just like if you, you know like look you know barry bonds hit however many home runs you got to hit this many home runs in order for you to be part of the hall of fame as i see it or whatever now, to be is. fair i'm not voting for the barry Bondses that are on this year's ballot no and i'm voting for the jim tomes that are on this year's ballot for those right. of you baseball fans out there <laughs> that are very good I don't. I don't know. I don't know what that means. I don't well, know who any of these people are. I know, right? It's crazy. <laughs> Look, the, the the point. The, you know, the, ultimately, it's about the Hall of Fame being like who is important in the Magic community. Obviously, this goes back to like why isn't BDM and Rosewater in there? But again, right. as a player who stood for something, as someone who can also, and this is another factor that I feel is important, is someone who's going to actually use the damn thing. Actually, going to show up to the Pro Tours. You now have yeah. invites for life. Can you show up? That would be I great. Agree. There's a huge I, percentage that just. I, I love Chris Pacula. But I don't think that he has what I look for in a Hall of Fame candidate more than the five people I chose. There's arbitrary lines. Arbitrary lines. Yeah. And lines well, are all arbitrary. all arbitrary lines for voting. Because this is another thing, though. I think that it's possible that perhaps the Hall of Fame, even though this is the first year I've had a vote, perhaps the Hall of Fame should not be a just a vote. It should just be people that Wizards wants to put in the Hall of Fame. Like, that's a really good point because it's it's always one of the most awkward things about Hall of Fame season that I find is when you see the Wizards folks chiming in, where you see Mark Rosewater saying, you know, everybody should vote for Chris Bakula. And it's like, why don't you just put him in there? Like, why do we have to yeah. see these awkward tweets from you and Lee Sharp and everybody else telling everybody else to when you can't you just do that? And they're like, oh, no, it's outside of our power. And to me, that's one of the most awkward things is, is seeing people seeing people at the Wizards level kind of you know stump for other people and i get it that you know you don't want one person to rule them all and to be able to lord over who gets in the hall of fame or whatever but like this is not really again this is this is sort of like the exact opposite of alex burton cheney right there's nobody on the other side i guess maybe Ruben, saying that maybe he shouldn't be in the hall of fame like i didn't vote for him either and that's fine because you know for me i i feel like it's about representing what 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 Chris was doing, what he represented, what how he fought when no one else was fighting. Like he was trying when no one else was trying. So I, I, I think really, Wizard should just pull the trigger, just for God's sake. I Who really cares? like Chris Pakula, and he definitely should have already been in the Hall of Fame. But we're not talking about who should have gotten in years ago. All right, missing sure. by one vote, missing by one top eight. That is a bar that has long since passed. We have so many valuable candidates that have four top eights already who have been clean players and who have been members of us, uh, uh, upstanding members of their community the whole time. Folks like Marie Liebert, Ken Yukihiro, mm -hmm. Mark Herberholtz, all of whom were on my ballot, all of whom have four top eights, all of whom are, are squeaky clean as far as I am aware. Um, and, and I think that, you know, Tsuyoshi Aikida is another one who wasn't on my ballot, who uh, uh, was, is up there, uh, uh, certainly worth the consideration. And that's not even getting to the folks with, three top eights with a win folks like jerry thompson craig wesco who have been ha had a little bit of a groundswell behind them so it's just um you know i think that it is a, it's an arbitrary line on my end but it's also an arbitrary line on your end like I, I i don't i don't see the difference and i'm not saying that there is a large difference in terms of just the lens in which we view it but for example sure. to being like you know you wouldn't have voted for for patrick chapin after he won pro tour journey to nicks and i'm just no, saying, no i would have voted for him after he won pro tour journey in the next which that's was his four. fourth top eight was that his fourth or his third? that was his fourth top eight with a win okay i'm pretty sure I do want to I do want to bring it back to what you said, Ruben. You made a comment about people kind of having these sort of pristine reputations, and you know I mentioned that on the last show that that's not necessarily a deal breaker for me. And in fact, you know one of the people I really picked, uh, one of the people I picked kind of for that reason is Jerry Thompson. You know, Jerry is sort of the blueprint of somebody who's come back from having you know, maybe a, a rocky start, you know, maybe having a rocky reputation and really kind of growing as a person and really learning from that. Um, he wrote an article on Star City Games, which a lot of people reference as to how to kind of turn things around and how to really stage an effective comeback. And Jerry's really shown a lot of growth as a person. He's really leaned into, you know, his status in the community, what with him selling all of his goods, you know, yeah. when it comes back from a tournament, take the trophy, take the sleeves, take this, I don't care. You know, now he's doing the, I believe it's a suicide fundraiser, a suicide prevention yeah. fundraiser. Yeah. Um, well, and so, he did. You know, and he, it raised a bunch of money, and that was great. Yeah, so I think he really is sort of the picture of that. And so, you know, uh, the one thing I, I found really fascinating is sort of this idea that people have to be, 
you know, kind of flawless or kind of be perfect. And, you know, even on a, even on a cheating factor, it's like, you know, a, a, a one off cheat for me is not necessarily a deal breaker. If Trevor Humphreys were to come back or if Jared Betcher were to come back after however many years and really show, you know, that growth and that, and that change and, and doesn't do the same thing again, I might be inclined to deal with that. And there were certain people on the ballot that unfortunately there were multiple mistakes, but, you know, there were some people that for some people, you know, who had ballots, one mistake was already too many. And that wasn't something I could really get behind. You know, I, I've said it before, I like a little stank on someone. And if somebody can, you know, if somebody maybe isn't perfect, but has come a long way or has shown that growth, I can get behind you. And I prefer a minimum stank. I like to keep that stank level low. Uh, <laughs> but I just, you know, going. I just don't have that. I, I think, if, like I said, if you are in a position where you can judge somebody like that, by all means, but who am I? Who am I to look at somebody and say, you're not flawless enough? I, I have no position to say that. And so I really leaned on Jerry, not only for his results, but specifically for the way that he's grown as, as a personality and, and the way that people look up to him and what he's done with himself. Absolutely. So I would like a, I mean, obviously we've had this conversation before, but because it's Hall of Fame season, I do want to say it again, that uh, there definitely needs to be a branch of the Hall of Fame that is not only players. It needs to have a, a community section um, and if that existed, then folks like, for example, I think Randy Bueller would be in the Hall of Fame twice at that point, but certainly folks like BDM. And at that point, Chris Pakula has enough points spread across yeah. both that I, like, I think he would probably be there. I like uh, how, as far as, sorry? Uh, I like how um, John Finkel can get in like four times or something. Yeah, <laughs> <It's> like <laughs> four, four top eights with three wins. <laughs> he can get in three or four times. Yeah. Oh my I mean, God. that's that's the other argument is a small hall, right? That has mm -hmm. John, Kai, LSV, Gabe Nassif, uh, PV, and like that's it for now. And then Owen is close, right? Like that's mm -hmm. that's the level that we're talking about with that. Wow. All right. So there was. So let's go back out. Let's go back to uh, the first pick. We've we've talked about the Pakula issue, but it, it goes way deeper than that. There is a podcast called Pro Points, and on it is Sam Black, as well as, I believe, uh, Paulo Vitor de Monterosa and uh, Mike Sigrist, I believe is the yep. three. And uh, they get around to the Hall of Fame, and Sam Black talks a little bit about Brad and saying that, personally, I will never vote for Brad. I believe that Brad stalled me at Worlds in a match that very likely could have cost me a Worlds top four. He calls Brad... Uh, essentially discrediting one of his top eights because it was from quote essentially a stolen list now this is a thing this this is a thing in the pro circles where you know people kind of people need a deck and you'll find some people who are incredibly good at magic players and this is of course the night before you didn't have to do it like the wednesday before uh who were given deck lists just on the fly and just played those decks instead and that's what they did at pro tour what well, was it, san juan and uh yeah. and, and brad top eight did that pro tour so it's like is that you know legitimate quote unquote because he didn't actually build the deck because when it came time to sort of pay the piper and be like hey you know, would you give me a deck for this pro tour? And he's like, ah, oh, the people I'm working with, you know, I like, can't, can't do that. And I'm, so I'm just not going to, it's not going to do anything there. So there was no, there was no reparations. There was no lists that were provided, you know, reciprocally. Mm. Uh, and, and yeah, it kind of gets weird. Um, and then PV uh, talks about other instances of leaking decks, slow pay, play or stalling. And you know, it's one of those where we're talking, we're talking about the, the crimes of opportunity or whatever. And then Brad shows up and is like, yo, I didn't want to make this, but his attacking his integrity in public, you can't ignore. Um, and Sam Black's slanderous accusations against my character and his podcast have deeply affected me, which is really sucky. Uh, and he, essentially he goes, you know, he says he's probably tempted to, uh, let's see here. Uh, become aware that people, including Sam, have probably attempted to damage my reputation by swaying the, the personal opinions of our peers. I only know this because they tried to manipulate even those closest to me. So that's really interesting. It was it feel, it makes him feel checkmate in a game he didn't know he was playing. Um, for the record, he doesn't cheat. He's never cheated. He'll never cheat. But he'll call you out on your BS. Oh, here we go. Here we go. And here comes the <laughs> mama. We. Oliver the champ is here, everybody. The champ <laughs> the shows champ. up in the conversation. Tomajko, Mr. Oliver Tomajko, uh, responds to this and says, Brad, <laughs> ever since I beat you at my first Pro Tour when I was 14, you have accused me of cheating and spread rumors about me. I've never cheated and likely have less rules and fractions than you by a margin, significant margin. Uh, baseless accusations, foul by my perception of you, 
substantially hurt my reputation. Okay. In fact, oh Boy. baby, this oh, is here the we juice. Go. At the last pro tour, you slandered my name at a dinner table with a bunch of your pro friends, and I know this because my mama, <laughs> my mother, was sitting a couple of tables away. Her dinner that night was ruined as she had to hear a so-called leader of the magic community and make disparaging comments about her son. And yeah, so this got <laughs> gross. At which point Brad notes, and it goes on if you want to read it, go nuts. While I do feel deeply ashamed that your mother had to hear this, okay, that's the sentence, I have addressed my concerns to you personally, only then to see you insult my character and weight on a stream. In my mind, I took the appropriate channel by coming to you first. <sighs> and then we try to get, then we car, then we start going, and then we start going. And Look, it we, is important at this point to note that. Very, very, very few people in the magic community, let alone the world, care about the Hall of Fame. Sure. Th that's like the thing. 90, I would say probably close to 90% of the people who play magic, maybe significantly higher than that, even are aware that a Hall of Fame exists. So I mean, if, magic, magic cares so much about the Magic Hall of Fame that it doesn't even have a physical location. So with that said, this is a this is uh, the people that do care about it are very protective and very um uh pious towards the hall of fame and and what it involves um well and, man this year has had some unique opportunities to showcase that well we started with talking about crap from a mama and we kind of ended up into brad uh essentially oliver's saying either way brad shouldn't be insinuating that someone's a cheater unless he's positive that it's true Brad's been attacking my character to my peers at least a year before PT Kaladesh, and this is confirmed from multiple first-hand accounts, which Brad responds, you're absolutely correct, and I sincerely apologize. All of my actions were not merited, and they brought unnecessary complications into your life. To you, I'm the biggest antagonist on this subject, but I was not the origin of it. I'll gladly discuss further with you in private. So that's, that's, I mean, you know. And also yesterday... Yesterday, Sam tweeted, I'd like to clarify that I do not believe that Brad is a cheater. If you play against him, you should expect that he'll outplay you in a game that follows the rules of magic. That was a tweet that he sent yesterday. That's nice. Well, um, of course, Reed Duke, Bay, yeah. uh, Aaron, you know, <laughs> he swoops down and the sun is shining bright mm. and the, the wind is blowing through the locks and it's just, he's yeah. there with the his beard. sword. Don't forget the beard. Oh, the on Captain daybreak America. on the third day, look to the east. Well, there shall be. He says, for both Brad and Oliver, actions speak louder than words, even if it doesn't always feel that way. Rumors aren't checkmate, and they won't preclude you from being accepted. If your conduct matches the way you want people to see you, that's what will shine through. And it's just... It's and, better than oysters, let me tell yeah. you. And then he flew off to the Fortress of Solitude. We didn't <laughs> see him again for a while. This is this is so wholesome. Alexa, play Somewhere Over the Rainbow. <laughs> Did you see what CFB is going to be doing for him at GP Richmond, where they're literally yes. going to be following him around all day long? I can't. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Other than the Brawl Championship, that's the thing I'm most excited for. <laughs> the what? The who? I, I, I've long since forgotten what I just said. Oh my is that God. after the Tiny Leaders PTQ? or yes. the? I just the frontier 5k is that happening i can only imagine the amount of, of pressure that would put on you to be like you know we're literally all of coverage is about you this weekend don't screw it up you yeah. know like there were people that were actually against this like what a world what like, no he's, he's they were like oh well it's legacy and then he's playing this particular deck and rah rah sis boom ba and i was just like how dare you like nah. how yeah, according to the New York New Yorker, Reed Duke is the gentleman of magic. That is his official <laughs> nickname, which we'll get to that New Yorker yes. article later. But we, uh, we will. to summarize, I wanted to I wanted to briefly go over uh, one, uh, two other things that I thought were interesting about our Hall of Fame picks, and I wanted to ask you guys about in a non red zone fashion. Mm -hmm. All right, no hate. I'm just curious. Uh, Aaron, you only had four people on your ballot. And I was curious as to why you made that decision. So I, this is my first time having a ballot and I had even asked you guys sort of like, what is the, what is the expectation? Because some people had only voted for two people and some people only voted for three people. And so you guys had told me that there really isn't a wrong answer. Like some people choose to use all five of their votes and some people don't. And so for me, you know, being kind of a newer, you know, member of the committee, 
committee, there were just some people I, I quite frankly didn't know enough about. And it wasn't necessarily that I didn't think they were qualified, but you know, there were people I was very fluent in and I felt very knowledgeable about. And then there were people that were, you know, I'm, they certainly had the numbers, but I knew nothing about that. And for me, I wanted a more well-rounded picture than just simply numbers. You know, I wanted sure people, enough. like one of the reasons I picked Lee Shi Tian is because, you know, he's lovingly referred to as kind of the Asian Willie Eel and the way that he mentors Asian magic players and MTG Min Car and, and the way that he gets involved politically with things happening in his country and his homeland and just sort of the all around picture of him as a deck builder, as a mentor, as a player, that's really what I was looking for. And ultimately I just felt like a lot of the remaining candidates certainly had the numbers, but I just didn't know enough about them or I felt like they really hadn't broken through as being anything other than good players. And I was just looking for more well-rounded candidates. Excellent. And that segues nicely into my second question, which ends up being that all three of us after all of the drama and all of the consternation and all of the discussion last week, all three of us ended up putting Seth Manfield and Lee Shi Chan on our ballots. Absolutely. Um, and I struggled a lot with that based on, you know, the opinions of lots of folks who I know and respect right. uh, saying that perhaps they should, you know, wait a year, shouldn't be first ballot Hall of Famers, even though they're the two with the greatest stats on the ballot beyond Saito and Marcio, who both of whom are sort of still in timeout, I think we're all agreeing upon. Um, I, I struggled a lot with both of those because I, I it, 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 and I'm still not sure I made the right decision with putting them both on my ballot because I think that there is still lots of questions for both of them. Uh, and I wanted to, to ask you guys what you guys thought of Lee Shi Chan and Seth Manfield. Well, we we don't have a lot of time. But... Lee Shi Tian was a no brainer for me. That was that was one I didn't even remotely consider not having him on my ballot. That was a snap vote for me. Um, I, I didn't really listen too much to other people. Like, I mean, I certainly was. I was keeping up with a lot of the discussions largely because we kind of have to, you know, as of the nature of the show, you know, we need to kind of have our fingers on the pulse of the community. And so I was largely observing a lot of the conversations. But for me, I didn't really take a lot of it to heart, not because I didn't believe the people, but I really felt like that was a trap that people were falling into in terms of so-and-so said this, that means I've got to do this. And that, and I saw a lot of that happening and I just didn't want to fall for that. I wanted to make my own conclusions, no, no matter how unpopular they might have been. And I really just wanted to, you know, look at stats for myself and really wade into the spreadsheets and wade into Reddit posts and really see what was going on. And just, um, I, it was really important for me to not necessarily do what other people were telling me to do because especially being a new ballot holder i really felt i would have been susceptible to that and so i sure. just didn't even really i knew what people were saying i didn't really delve too deeply into it lee was just an automatic conclusion for me um seth i mostly it was just a matter of kind of um you know dotting my eyes and crossing my t's of like i think he's good he's good we could hear we good we're good um and so there really wasn't a struggle for either of those two Lishi, well, I mean, re as you recall, Ruben, when we like first were like, wow, we got the ballot, the ballot's here. And you're like, Lishi Tian, right home, you know, slam dunk. And I'm like, whoa, yeah. whoa, because, because, well, because then the, 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 you know, the, the drama got started, essentially. Yeah. The engine of, you know, doubts and accusations and this one time at this one event. And, whoa, did you check coverage that one time? And they took all this time doing so and so. And the rumors of this, rumors of that, to the point yeah. where Lishi Tian had to come out with a giant, you know, Google Doc that which I enjoyed. I did like his statement a lot, which I appreciate. Yeah. Even as unfair as it may seem, he did sort of go through and say, "Look, this happened. Sometimes you play a second land like that. Honestly, legitimately happens all sure. the time." I, but... I discarded to a conflagrate once that wasn't in my graveyard. Jonathan Lopes <laughs> had a great Reddit post this week about all of the times that he unintentionally took a cheat of opportunity or or did something that was close to the line or something like that. Right. And he is a, uh, a well-respected member of the Magic community, both in R&D and out. So anyway, we have to keep moving. We got so much to talk about, such as uh, Jer Jepen Zerter Reisenwurm. Is that right? I'm actually changing my drag name to that. Just to I was going to say, please do that one more time. <laughs> We're taking a hard left turn, audience. <laughs> Japan yeah, set the rise and bomb. Can I can yeah. I can I get behind it? It's the <laughs> it is the bio box promo for Guilds of Ravnica. It leaked through a German site. It oh, is, it's pregnant Vraska. Yeah. Is the uh yeah, Vraska sort of yeah, holding sort of like holding her stomach like that? Yep. 
I don't know what's going on there, but Kurt Jace went half on a baby. Just does that box say Portal on the side? Yes, Portal is the app that they announced earlier this year that was supposed to be able to like sort of run home tournaments and find events and all this other stuff. It was supposed to be the app that we kind of always imagined Wizards would make. Do you know now, anybody that's used it? No, 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 it's not released. So oh. like, but considering they actually have, you know, people like a really good staff now where they didn't have before, I think they can actually make this happen in well, the way they wanted it to happen. So Well I mean MT Arena is is I think legitimately succeeding. Like it is doing No, well. but just it you just said they have a really good let's get back to the six I'm talking about IT elephant in the room. I'm talking about programmers. Okay, because I was gonna say the point is Jerpenzerta Risenvarm. I think it's yeah, isn't is it is, is it, it a hard or is it a soft Gepenzerter? The Gepen point is I'm southern. <laughs> I'm too southern for this. It's a giant armored worm. Okay, that's what that means. Yeah. It is three green and seven generic mana. That is that's pretty huge. Yeah. Um, for it a is sixteen sixteen with indestructible and convoke. Convoke is back. Saffron Olive is already brewing around this card. I can feel it. I mean, right. this is so so. And someone put it really interesting on uh, Twitter. It was like, you know, before the largest creature in Magic was this unbelievably powerful god that like you know ran entire storylines and like can crush entire universes and blah blah blah. And now we got like this giant worm underground that happens to be larger than it. It's a worm. right. It's a giant yeah. worm. Okay. It's just a big giant dork, and that's cool. But that's all it is. So, if I don't I mean, think uh, yeah. this is going to break anything, I don't think we're even near Nexus of Fate these days. No. But, but we'll see. Maybe maybe someone breaks it. I don't know, though. If you would have told me that a seven mana time walk was going to break standard, I probably sure. would believe you. I'm still waiting for Fire Song and Sunspeaker to make its appearance on the big stage. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That hasn't happened yet. So, that's, that's a thing that showed up. It's a giant freaking worm and uh and you're gonna get i don't get how this lives in ravnica is my thing a couple people had asked that there's been a lot of talk about ravnica and a lot of you know guessing and and theorizing as to what's going to happen a lot of people have asked like where do all these worms live exactly like it's this is supposed to be a cityscape and then the plane is supposed to be entirely covered by city and yet you have armada worms and you have this thing and you have where do they go like do they live under like how does this people are really asking about the logistics of it all and now they're always shown on the surface of the world right. and really? ravnica is a city of layers yeah sure and there but there's been like street breaker worm like there's been a bunch of famous worms from ravnica worms are a thing there yeah. was the make two five five worm spell from from rtr like there's a whole bunch of yeah. you know worm things going on it's just this is the the biggest and this is the most right. giant one and they can't ever kill it all right cool so uh moving on here we need to go to Cal the town folks should have been there to start with Watsi affiliated artists Anna Steinbauer, Magali oh uh, Villanov, and Titus Lunter were detained by ICE in Seattle. And this was really crazy, honestly. Um, basically, the long story short is the artist flew in, something was wrong with their visas, the artist got put in jail until the next day, and then they got flown back home. Mm -hmm. And that, that in and of itself is kind of insane, that we get to put people in jail and stuff when they're the other visas aren't it's not exactly jail right. it's it's just a it's a just a holding facility detainment center where yeah. they were detained wait it's way better it's totally better um but the point is you know that's that right happened. that's right pharmacist judge this shouldn't be gather this should be deport the townsfolk wow <laughs> wow <laughs> really good insight from our buddy the pharmacist judge yeah. whoa yeah um re revoke the citizenship of the townsfolk yeah. um but uh, Wizards of the Coast, of course, is, is doing the best they can to assist. Um, and I do want to add that the artists, particularly Magali, have been very careful in terms of asking people not to point fingers, not to not to assign blame. Mm -hmm. You know, she's stressing that Wizards is doing everything they can, and that even the people responsible. Um, you know, Titus Lunter said this too. Even the even the people in customs and even the people from you know ICE that they worked with were were nice to them. They weren't mistreated. They weren't you know abused or anything. Um, it was just a, a traumatic experience, but not because of the people involved. They they really wanted to stress that. Right. And, and and, and so, and some are seeing that sort of like, well, we, you know, we're covering Watsi's butt. And it's like, Watsi is a private company. Like, these are the work visas they had. Maybe they were wrong. Maybe Wizards could have done more. But at this point, 
you can't put that toothpaste back in. You just got to yeah. work on the fix. And it's nice to see everyone sort of come out and support the artists. Um, it, it's nice for Hipsters of the Coast to continuously update this article with different statements as people made them and stuff. So that was really yep. cool and it was good journalism. It was just so terrifying to watch because we had seen them leading up to this. You know, I know I follow Titus personally. Mm -hmm. You know, they had all tweeted prior to this of like, you know, we'll see you guys in like a month or so. We're all going to, you know, the U.S. We're working on this D&D &D thing. You see Magali kissing her husband goodbye, you know, spending their last couple of days together. Right. And it all happens so fast. Like they land, they're pulled aside, they're pulled out of line, they're interviewed for hours on end by customs. Mm -hmm. Customs determines that the visa I issue exists. They're not allowed to spend the night in the airport. So they have to go to the ICE detention center. You know, they're staying in this really little room that doesn't even have a bed. And then in the course of 48 hours, and that's a long flight. So you're looking at a nine, 10 hour flight. Then you After get- not sleeping, yeah. Right, you're sent to this detention center and then you're sent back home the following day, all in the course of 48 hours. And so that is a lot. That's a very traumatizing experience. And just to watch it all kind of go down in live tweets and, and notes and things. And Magali's husband really being only the point of con the only point of yeah. contact. Well, he was the only one awake because yeah. it was 3 a.m. Europe time. But just right. to feel so helpless about it, and it just happens so fast. Before we knew it, it's bam, they're on a plane back already, and it's like, yeah. I mean, wow. on August, August 25th, Alex, uh, who is, I believe, Magali's husband, uh, yep. notes that Magali was detained at customs with other members. Apparently, they won't let them back into the country. Uh, and, and apparently, this this type of visa uh, only allows certain sort of, you know, certain sort of uh, visitors for uh, pleasure or for yeah, business. And I'm going to awesome. narrow. I hope I don't that know. there's some more information that comes out about the details, like the minutia of exactly what happened here, visa wise and passport wise, because it just feels like due diligence wasn't done somewhere. I mean, right. we we transport artists all over the place to. They've been here. Uh, They've all been here. Foreign grand prix and whatnot. So. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the other issue is that their ESTA eligibility has been canceled forever. So if those three want to come back in the country, they need to have yeah. a full visa. So that could affect them getting back here for GPs. It right. could affect them working with wizards again for modules like that. Like they've all said that this isn't going to impact them financially. And yeah. so uh, there were even a couple of folks on Twitter that were starting their own kind of initiatives of hey. These three have prints, these three have play mats. Let's toss them a couple of bucks because they are going to be affected by this. And that's, right. that's, that's terrible. That is terrible. And uh, yeah, and I'm always, they... I'm always surprised when all of my interests are put into one news story, magic art, obviously dungeons and dragons concept push, very happy about and abolishing ice. All three of my big interests. <laughs> all together right there for you. So uh, moving on to more positive things, and obviously good luck, and we wish the best to all those artists Absolutely. affected. Uh, they are introducing a Magic Game Night product and updated gift pack. So Wizards unveiled Game Night, which is a sort of like if they could just make Magic a board game, this would be super cool. Yeah. Magic, Magic Game Night is a $40 product and will contain five pre-constructed decks, one of each color, plus all the accessories you need to play, spin down life counters, life counter platforms, plus one plus one counters, and five reference cards. And so, and I'm showing it to you on the screen now if you're watching the video, uh, but there's more. Each of the five decks has an exclusive card. Each one, uh, or all, th these cards and any other reprinted cards not already in standard are not standard legal because, you know, figuring out standard legality is super easy these days. <laughs> Militant Angel is the mythic rare in the white deck. It's two white and three generic mana for a 3-4 angel with flying and lifelink. When it enters the battlefield, you create a number of 2-2 two, two white knight creature tokens with vigilance equal to the number of opponents you attacked this turn. The number of opponents thing is kind of the refer recurring theme here. Inspired Screams Phoenix. Screams Commander, though. Oh, yeah. This, and this yeah. seems fun. Yeah. Um, Inspired Phoenix is, is a seven mana five five. I won't go over all each of them because it's just going to take too long. But you can check out the article. These none of these mythics are going to impact your standard landscape, your competitive whatever. You might Correct. find some cool casual cards which are neat, such as the giant green monster that gets plus one plus one for each land you control when you attack. That card's really cool. Um, yeah. But again, you're not going to be able to play in standard, so whatever. I'm I'm a big fan of the angler turtle just from a flavor perspective and the six mana goblin because why why wouldn't you make a six no, mana goblin? No, these are going to be these five cards from the gift pack are going to be a part of standard. Oh, cool! Wait, it says are? the five cards are aimed at the plane. If I'm understanding correctly, the five cards are aimed at the planeswalker deck level and ah. will be considered part of core set 2019 for legality and rotation purposes. So Let's not the multiplayer cards. 
No, but there's five cards beneath it. Angelic Guardian, Angler Turtle, Vengeant Vampire, Rampaging Bronzedon, one for every color, and then Immortal, Immortal Phoenix. Right. So we've skipped over. We've skipped to the gift pack. <clears throat> okay, sorry about the that. The gift pack is different than the Game Night. The Game Night product oh. is the one that, that are not legal. The gift I see. pack is legal. I see my mistake. Uh, again, this is really easy to understand, right? Uh, where you have, Why was this put in the same article? <laughs> because they they have a whole lot of products and they got to get all this information out because we're about to go straight Guilds of Ravnica for like three weeks. That's right. Um, so, so yeah, and again, you'll see them on the screen. These are some like neat, cool, casual cards. Um, and, and I was incorrect. That Rampaging Brontodon, seven mana, seven, seven Trampler. When it attacks, it gets plus one, plus one for each land. Uh, until in turn for each land you control. That's that's a pretty big monster, honestly. That's a, that's um, a big boy. But you also have lands in this gift pack uh, that will also be art that you've likely seen before, but now all shiny and sweet. Yeah. Which is really cool. Uh, it's just 20 bucks. You get those cards, you get those lands. Cool. Uh, as well as looks like a spin yeah, down, yeah. Uh, which is nice. And, uh, and yeah, so they've been trying to get this gift pack thing right for a while. The gift box, the original box, I thought was actually pretty decent. Uh, and then they seemed to start attacking the quality of the product. The actual cardboard got thinner. Uh, the, what they gave you turned into less or whatever. And then all of a sudden now we're into like blister packaging, which is very similar to sort of uh, Pokemon where, where they just sort of show you uh, these cards that you're going to get. And the only way you can get them is through this gift pack, which is, again, another set of cards that you can't get from booster packs. You can only get it this way. Mm. They, they continue to ride that train. Hmm. And I think we're going to see eventually that they're just going like they're going to push it until something breaks, honestly, because yeah. the ability to put different cards, unique cards in different products will make those products sell better. It's just yeah. Explorers of Ixalan says, what's up? Go go check out that product <laughs> and how no one bought it because it was just a bunch of reprints, even if they were good reprints. Right. It just wasn't worth it. And maybe yeah. these new cards will get people to buy them. Hmm. So that is the game night and the gift pack for this year. Um, however, we do have some exclusive token. I'm sorry, not tokens. Exclusive miniatures, Ooh. yeah, if you will, uh, to preview. I'm going to bring the first one here in just a second. Thanks to WizKids, I guess, for giving yeah. us uh, these awesome things to preview. The official name of this product, ladies and gentlemen, oh boy. is a lot. Let me find it. It is the WizKids Games Magic the Gathering Creature Forge Overwhelming Swarm miniature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ruben, you want to tell us about your miniature? Your, your yeah, figure? of course I do. What other miniature could I possibly be talking about other than, is it on the screen? Uh, I can bring it up on the screen here. In Great, bring it second. up on the screen. There what What miniature would I possibly want to talk about more than a delightful, uh, horrifying, angry goblin token mm -hmm. um which hopefully is on the screen now it's carrying screen. a nice a nice mace with some spikes and really <laughs> nice leathers here uh some delightful delightful uh, uh dental work done for this particular slick back haired goblin mm -hmm. um that you can that has the red base and you can use as either a one one goblin token in your magic game or as a uh, a, a challenge rating one angry dude to fight against your dungeons and dragons or pathfinder characters um yeah I, i'm just a, I just pleased as punch that i get this silly little <laughs> dude so that was super sweet and aaron what is your figure as we have three to debut here i mean it's glamorous it's radiant it's regal and it's giving you some serious side eye kind of like yours truly um mm. i have the pegasus uh miniature uh which is very fitting if you happen to play any of your sacred mesa decks if you're a big fan of that sort of play style you know this is definitely the figurine that you want to be using and it's just it's just very cute and very sassy which i can certainly relate to it definitely is giving side eye look at that little like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the pegasus that don't need no memes <laughs> right well, I guess I'll have to uh, follow it up here with, uh, are, are we are we on brand? I don't know if we're brand in here. You are on brand, my I friend. I guess we're on brand because I have the bear. <laughs> the bear <laughs> miniature figure token thing. Give the people made. what they want. I, we're I don't know what Evan Arwen previewing the bear. All For right? those in the chat, I'm going to let you guys a little secret. So we've been, we've been kind of having some behind the scenes talks about what we want our tokens to be for Guilds to Ravnica. Oh. And we each have to come up with two different creature types that we want. And we are pretty close to getting Evan to be the bear. So yeah. if you guys want to two Evan Irwin bear, Evan Berwin token, they're happening. Oh, oh my just, God, Evan Berwin. Well, <laughs> 
and no, for what it's worth, uh, do note these are not pictures; these are three D mock ups. But yeah. I will note that I have seen these in in my you know I've I've touched and held them at Gamma. Uh, they are incredibly detailed. If you know they, now, they look like this because these are some detailed freaking minis. Yeah, yeah. I gotta like, say they do a really great job. If you have any D and D minis, like the official D and D minis, uh, yeah. it's very similar to those. Sure. Which the the detail I'm just blown away by. Honestly, when you look at it, you're like, wow, how did you get this you know facial expression and the paint that the same way and you know. Nice. All those things are, are really difficult to nail. So, uh, so do note that that is that is a, a factor. You're not looking at the the actual figure. You're looking at images of it. But thanks very much to WizKids for providing. Yeah, that. thanks WizKids. I'm 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 excited for these. Uh, I'm probably more likely to use them as the tabletop gamer of the three of us. Right. Um, but uh, but you shouldn't feel ashamed to use these at your local uh, uh, pre-release or casual events. I don't think that these type of three-dimensional tokens are legal in like competitive REL events but uh i mean if you happen to be making not. yourself some bear tokens or some, some goblin I mean, tokens i would i would i would, I would be more than happy to bring a back a backpack full of zombie tokens to my next event let me sure. just, just, just like, like just just them sideways <laughs> just tilt them all just over at the same time the like the mahjong tiles in that one study <laughs> like you throw the zombies across the table to display dominance okay that's yeah. how that works look Them's my peeps, all right? <laughs> and they're all attacking. Look. How much damage is coming in? This many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This much. Oh, my God. All right. So moving on here. Uh, something Wizards should have done absolutely forever ago, but they are finally doing now. Uh, they have officially hired three Pro Tour consultants who will help mm -hmm. them work on organized play and stop making so many boneheaded moves because, wow. Good choices. There's yeah. a lot. Uh, first of all, I cannot. I cannot <laughs> say this name. I can't do it. I'm sorry. Eduardo Sajalik. Eduardo Sajalik. That's fantastic. I, I, you didn't want me to tackle that one without without a guide. You know what I'm saying? I don't go in that forest Speaking alone. Of Evan, did you see that they're going to be releasing a pronunciation guide? I think it is for Guild of Ravnica. Look at you. There you go. I'm you so and happy. Saffron Oliver are just going to get together with a couple of beers and just read them off to each other. <laughs> I've been wanting this for like Flash 12 tires. years. You know? Could you just tell me how to say the names of your crap? Saffron's going to be like, Jimmy. And you're gonna be like dimmer. <laughs> Dim right. Hey y'all, it's dimmer. It's right here, dimmer. Well, for this, for for these players, it should. The other two aren't too hard. The the other two are not. Uh, being Willie Edel and Huey Jensen. So Willie. Uh, so those are all fine choices for, for the pro. This is the pro player consultants thing that we talked about last week. Yes, and that's that's terrific. They want to improve all areas of organized play. So please, wizards, listen to them. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Okay. So I, just a, just I a also really appreciate good, really choice of all three. I also appreciate, and I don't know if it's intentional or not, but I also appreciate that they got people with reach in different uh, geographical areas. You know, yep. I do believe uh, Eduardo. Um, I know he works with MTG Mint Card in the past, so he definitely has inroads with the with the Asian players and possibly even the European or even the Canadian players as well. Yep. You know, obviously Huey Jensen's American, but you know, you have Willie Edel, who's been very vocal about South American magic and mm -hmm. and and Latin players and things of that nature and Portuguese players. And so I really, I don't know if that was intentional or not, but I do think only good things can come from having you know that range of experiences you don't just want it to be a bunch of americans trying yeah. to put the american answer in sure. europe and asia and because those America. communities have such unique challenges too exactly so how i also appreciate so? that they chose uh elder statesmen shall we say folks who've been on the scene for a long time yeah um and and who've been at the highest echelons of play for as long as they have. Uh, I just think that these are three really excellent choices. So in the let's not forget about this news, uh, Alex Burton Cheney is still able to play professional level magic. He's still able to play in any event he feels like, and he has a long history of cheating. Somehow, somehow copped to all his cheating without talking about any other cheating that he did, which was convenient. Um, and essentially, I mean, he including yours truly said, you know what, we'd be better without him. And Wizards said nothing, and Wizards finally said something. And it's better to say something than nothing at all. Uh, and they noted, they said, it has always been important to us that competitive magic is fair and honest, but we can do more. We're following the conversation and we're starting a process to work with key community members to evaluate DCI policies and tournament rules to keep magic a leader in competitive gaming. I don't care what it takes, man. We need to be in a world that doesn't, that doesn't let Burton Cheney make top eights and win events because you know, again, I, I wish I, I my I, I tried to feel for the kid like the first time, and I tried to feel for the kid like the second time. It's there's only so many times, you know, where you're like, look, 
Yep. We we have to be done here. You have to. There's a million games. Go play them. You're a good Aaron's gamer. Aaron's line of you get one you get one strike and then the second strike and you're out. I think is exactly right. I think that the punishment for cheating should be even harsher than it already is. The other problem, and we ran into this uh, um, in a different way with the Hall of Fame discussion, is that it is it's actually pretty difficult to get suspended for cheating right now. The judges don't have the uh, the tool set to be able to actually catch people who are right there on the edge. Mm -hmm. The people who are using uh, uh, that are harming the game um and it's not just alex it's folks you know, it's it's lots of folks um and it's it's it is still a problem and it is nice that watsy is saying they're listening right. but again actions speak louder than words as one mr reed duke said uh, and, and so it's, you know it's nice that we have something like and there's some people who are like sure. you know and there's people like wizards can never win wizards is always in the no win scenario like it's it's like mono Kaba, Kaba, kabayashi maru or whatever the the star trek scenario that you have to <laughs> kobayashi lose kobayashi maru kobayashi yeah. maru thank you so Eduardo they... <laughs> Sajule, dimmer hey y'all it's dimmer <laughs> Look, the real wizards, problem is that uh, some of the win. members, I know that some of the members inside of uh, Watsi call it Simich. Oh, for God's sake. Now, Simich. Look, all I'm saying is they're getting criticized because they took a while to respond even to this much, and they're getting criticized that they haven't done something sooner. Like, they do stuff too fast. They do stuff too slow. They don't answer the right way. They didn't say the right thing. Like, I want some amount of movement because it's not every day I write an article saying we shouldn't have this person in our game anymore, but, like, we really shouldn't have this person in our game anymore. You know what I'm saying? So, thank you, Wizards, for something. Uh, let's hope these actions do follow it thereafter. All right. So, let's move on here to Desperate Ravings. Some crazy stuff going on in the community. A terrific article written by Brian Brondoon. Who wants to who wants to take this one? Uh, so I can start because I was I saw the tweet that kind of launched this conversation. Uh, so our friend Cat Light had made a tweet, and she was kind of talking about how you know the worst thing that can happen to you know uh, let me let me just get the exact wording right. But basically, she said um, uh, some Matt, actually Matt Phelps said this. I do apologize, and he said a hot take, a good finish at a big Magic tournament. It's one of the worst things that can ever happen to a non-professional magic player. And then our friend Cat Light replied to this, a spirits guru, she loves herself some spirits and modern, and she kind of built off the conversation and said that she, you know, has really felt this, you know, as somebody who's had some recent success herself and, you know, the pressure to kind of keep doing well and to, and to stay relevant. And so, um, you know, B, BBD then chimed in and wrote this article and was just talking about how he really feels the pressure as a pro magic player that, you know, we live in a community that is such a meritocracy and that everything is tied to your successes and tied to your results and what happens when you don't have that anymore like when you're not good you know in a lot of ways you kind of cease to stop existing your opinion seems to matter less and people stop you know coming to you as much and you know how he feels how he felt this pressure at one point to just keep it going it through whatever you know by whatever cost and so um, a lot of people really related to this you know i certainly related to this as a content creator even even not necessarily as a, as a pro magic player but just the, the the feeling of like and you see this sometimes even with a lot of the bigger youtube stars is them sort of going to like crazier stunts to like keep their names in the in the papers and you know every day it feels like there's a new streamer or a new youtuber or a new podcaster and you know I, i'd be lying if i said i didn't have moments where i was like oh god am i and am I not relevant anymore? Am I not, you know, whatever? And so you, you do have to ask yourself that. And you do have to fight that pressure to, you know, starting beefs to stay relevant and, and talking about nonsense and, and should I be doing this? And yeah, I related to all of this in a very, very different way. It's, yeah. just, it's just about like, am I good enough to be in this realm, right? Do I have yeah. this chip on my shoulder? Uh, is there something I can do? Uh, and, you know, he, he sort of he mentions there, you know, sort of the grudges that he's held over the years because sure. somebody did something and later, can, you know, criticized him for it. And he just held on to that for years and years and like sort of proving you're not a fluke. You know, what I mean, like you did well that one time. Can you do well again? Like you have to keep on proving right. that you are as good as you think or say or people say you are. It's the old yeah. what have you done for you for me lately thing that that plagues everyone. Mm -hmm. um, we discussed it during the Hall of Fame discussion of from both Chris Pakula and folks like Mark Herberholt's perspective in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what have you done for me lately style attitudes is present everywhere. Yeah. Um, you know, after I stopped making magic content for a little while uh, and I was still chiming in on discussions, I was getting the who are you again kind of mm -hmm. responses. 
Um, you know, it's 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 uh, ever present everywhere, and yeah. it's really refreshing to see BBD address them in this article. It seems like this was an article that someone needed to write, and no one really knew it until he wrote it. And so, kudos to, to right. BBD. And so, I, I want to address this immediately. Uh, MTG Young Mage mentions in the chat that I still don't feel good enough to be an MTG YouTuber. You are absolutely good oh enough my God. to <laughs> be an MTG. Everyone who watches this show, you can be an MTG YouTuber. You can make a great piece of content. Absolutely, yeah. You can work at your content. You can be as good as you want to be. Uh, it's it's tough. I'm not going to lie. It's tough. I've, I've had an interesting, long, windy road here. you know what here. I was doing when I was Young Mage's age? I was reading The Babysitter's Club and eating macaroni and cheese out of the pot. I wasn't making YouTube videos. I wasn't winning RPTQs like Quinn Kiefer. Like, like you were doing more at your age than I've done, you know, in my teen years. Like you absolutely deserve your spot, little one. Right. It's and, and the I, other thing is that uh, that imposter syndrome is a huge deal in in the content creation uh, oh, yeah. sphere, and I suffer greatly from it. Um, and I would just say that there is a famous story about imposter syndrome from Neil Gaiman. Neil Gaiman was at an event. He was invited to a big fancy soiree with like hors d'oeuvres, entrees being served by men in tuxedos. And he was talking to another man and said, man, I don't really feel like I belong here. And the other man said, uh, I don't, you know, I always feel weird at, at events like big fancy events like that too. I just, I don't feel like I'm here. I belong here either. And the other guy said, well, but you're Neil Armstrong. How can you possibly <laughs> feel that way? It doesn't matter how big you get in everyone else's eyes the critic capital t capital c that lives right here in your brain will always tell you you're not good enough and it's something that as a content creator you do have to fight against as a professional in any facet particularly in competitive endeavors like magic the gathering you do need to constantly tell yourself yes i am good enough i am strong enough and gosh darn it people like me can i share the analogy that really hits home for me i'll never forget i saw a picture on twitter i can't remember the comic who drew it but it was basically uh, there was a man baking a cake and he's decorating his cake and he's looking over at the person who made a cake next to him and he's like oh man their cake has all these layers and their cake is frosting and my cake is crooked and my cake is like my cake is just crap my cake is crap it's never gonna be as good as his cake and then there's just a, a person who's not a baker who comes up and goes Sweet, I get two pieces of cake. Right. <laughs> and so you're sitting there and thinking what you have is not good enough because it doesn't look like that cake. It doesn't look as delicious as that cake. Meanwhile, the people consuming the cake are just happy to have two different pieces of cake. And so that's sort of the way that I rationalize a lot of things is like, you know, you know, my stream isn't polished enough and I may not know enough about this, but somebody's like, we can have both. You know, we can go listen to this show where they really, really are, are covering this topic really well. And I can go listen to you who really makes me laugh. And like, it really doesn't have to be about that because the people consuming it are just happy to have more. They're just happy you have all the things and so that's the way that i like to kind of soothe myself when i have those moments i think that going back to the to the article though i wanted to touch on the the original point of one good result can be horrendous uh for you um you know it's it's uh it's sort of the the one hit wonder scenario uh for magic it especially for for women or for folks who are minorities that can be a really tough time uh, on the internet, on Reddit and on Twitter, which don't necessarily, or, or on Twitch chat, which aren't necessarily the kindest places to people who aren't affluent young white men. Um, not to get, you know, too, too much into that, but uh, I think that that is another facet that is, is worth noting. So moving on here, Paul Ritzel tweeted earlier this week uh, that he says there's one problem. First of all, he's a great <laughs> follower at Paul First Ritzel. First of all, good. First of all, fantastic. Yes. Second of all, one he says, And, and I, I will never get past the fact that I taught him how to use Skype. So you're welcome, Paul. That's awesome. <laughs> well, one he says, one problem with streamed magic is we miss the banter from the players. I used to refresh the sideboard frantically waiting for written feature cut match coverage. I was buying the boosters regardless. What demanded my attention was the personalities. To which Aaron Forsyth uh, said, hey, emoting in-game has so many disincentives. Uh, this incentives right now, real and cultural. No one even acts happy when they win a match. It never even looks fun. If anything makes me want to rethink professional magic, it's this. And it kind of sort of essentially goes from there, which is, wow. And, and it also leads to, to my absolute favorite quote uh, from Aaron said, I remember people treating Ari's exaggerated attack with Zergo as if he'd puked on the prime minister. It's like, 
There yeah, were literal dare. headlines on blogs asking if Ari Lax was a monster. There was, those were literal titles of has Ari Lax gone too far? Is Ari, Ari Lax a monster? It was ridiculous. And, you know, I find it kind of fascinating in a way, you know, I have to kind of piggyback off Ruben here. I have to kind of bring up the gender thing. I do find it fascinating that we play a game that is, you know, played predominantly by men. And yet we're having conversations about hiding your emotions and withholding your emotions. I don't think that's a coincidence. And likewise, I do find it fascinating when I see the conversation turning to guys being emotional because you know women are always accused of being emotional but you know i was kind of in, I, I wasn't enjoying that ari was being criticized and likewise i wasn't enjoying when paulo got criticized because people said he wasn't acting happy enough when he won right. you were you were just sitting there fixing your sideboard what's wrong with you you know i did enjoy however that that was something that the other side had to deal with for once instead of us sort of being accused of sheep and i was chanel and it's like no you guys can have that discussion because we've been having it enough so i mean, thought it was very interesting to watch wizards tries to build up to a crescendo you know like when the final play happens and they're yelling and screaming or whatever about so-and-so's clinched the title and yada, yada, like they they sort of want to lead into you know right. like all the baseball players ran out on the field or all the people in the stadium just go nuts or the people at esports and like in, the, in their little plastic cage they put them in they're all just freaking out and flipping around like we just we don't really have that and in fact it's it is you're you're not incentivized at all to do that behavior in fact yeah. you get crapped on most of the time to do that behavior. yeah it is a weird goldilocks zone that you have to end up in where you know mark herberholtz and elias watzfeld have like some of the best all-time trophy photos of cheering and being happy and then obviously greg orange had the <laughs> that's a hilarious gift of him of being like yeah, is this good and yeah. like that's that's the level of emotion you're allowed to show yeah which is awkward right you can't have a moment like when jacob wilson lost and got interviewed and was like i feel sick to my stomach right now he, he got he got crapped on for that for a week but one of my oh, favorite wow. moments, and it actually had something to do with me voting for Seth Manfield for the Hall of Fame. I'll never forget when, when Seth won. Oh, God, I think it might have been the World Cup. It was the event they had at PAX um, when uh, Battle for Zendikar was made its debut. And I'll never forget when he won and he was so emotional that he like darted out of his chair and like looked like he was about to cry. And he just kind of like had to like compose himself. And I'd never seen that sort of raw emotion before. And that's what I want to see. You know, I want to see that from my pros. I want a reason to care. I want a reason to root for you. And I can't root for a robot. I just, I can't root for robots either. But, um, you know, I want, I want someone who kind of lets me in like that. And for someone to expose themselves like that, that vulnerability, I, I became even more of a fan of Seth after that weekend, just watching him just yeah. like, holy God, this happened and I can't keep it in. And I was like, oh, Seth. <laughs> it, is, it is such a bizarre issue though. And it, and it touches on so many things that are in, pot, in regular culture right now outside of magic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, so, so that is always a fascinating topic of like, man, can't we just be happy? Can I for one was excited? always on team Ari Lax, by the way. Oh yeah. I was always on as much emotion as is humanly possible, shout casting, you know, like go nuts, man. Like when you go win the nuts. world championship, you celebrate, do the Tiger Woods fist pump, jump up in the air, crowd surf, do all the things. Right, do, do whatever you gotta do. Well, that's my opinion. Uh, so moving on here to uh, Annalise Faustino, which is, did a great job at Baltimore with Mono oh. Green Tron. Uh, also noting in her sort of interview piece, why did you play the deck you played? Praise be to Karn. Praise be to Karn. <laughs> Praise be to Karn. So Annalise has been grinding uh, an East Coast grinder for a really long time. She, you know, she's just a great girl. Uh, nine and zero on her first and day one at wow. SCP Baltimore with Mono Green Tron. Uh, came back and made it all the way to the finals in day two and just absolutely crushed it. My favorite thing about her is her Twitter bio in which she says, "I'm a literal garbage fire." <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and you know, not to be outshone, Emma Handy won the Standard Classic. You know, thanks right. to that she put in with people like Autumn Burkett and Jessica Steffen. Um, and so it was a very big weekend for the two of them. And it was just so great to watch along at home because Annalise just kept winning and just kept winning. And she's like, so I'm nine and oh, like somehow. Right. <laughs> and there wasn't a single person that was just not rooting for her. Like Twitch, Twitch chat was so happy. Twitter was lit up. Um, she just really kind of won everybody's hearts that past weekend. And it was, it was good to watch. That's I just, I, and uh, we're going to keep talking about women having good results on the show. It's, it's going to be something we do keep talking about, but I do look forward to the day when we don't have to. Yeah. Um, but uh, with that said, congrats to Annalise. 9-0 is huge and making the, the finals, finals is huge. And that's, that's, that's just great to see. That yeah. is fantastic. So congratulations, Annalise. Hope you continue to rock and, and don't, don't let that chip get on your shoulder. We just talked about that. Okay. <laughs> He's already a garbage fire. So. <laughs> well, in, uh, in humorous news, uh, you know, once you thought you were out, 
Yeah, they pull you back in. Back in. in Godfather <laughs> 3 news, yeah. Andres Strosky, is that right? Andres? Andre, just Andre. Andre. Evan. God. You can't be this Southern. It's not <laughs> possible. I absolutely. Hey, Andres. Andre. Andre. Hey, Andre. Hey. It's, he says here, it's been a lot of fun these past couple years. I think it's time to retire from professional magic. I'll play one more GP in Prague unless I win. It's going to be my last tournament in a long time. That was from August 4th, and guess what? Yeah, of course. He he won it. <laughs> so he, he says, looking for the looking for Team Series team, like I'm playing all PTs. Also, this is BS. <laughs> that showed up just two days ago. Um, oh, that's glorious. And of course, here's Patrick Sullivan with, as always, the best, most consistent take of all time, which is, I followed you explicitly because you quit magic and now this? <laughs> just, Damn it. You can't, you can't make it up. It's so good. So welcome I, back, I, I like that this became a meme quickly afterwards mm -hmm. where Oliver Tomiko said, quitting magic unless I top eight the next PT. Jessica Stefan yeah. tweeted, you know, I'm quitting magic unless I'm the world champion in the next week and a half or whatever. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Really, so so welcome, welcome back, Andre. And yeah. I won't screw up your name. It's almost like you never left. If I can't help it. All right. So Alex Mount. Mount, Mount. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Immediately back into the to the boiling water. Majlaton. <laughs> Majlaton. Thank you. Majla Jesus. <laughs> Look unbelievable no it is you very believable for a living it is very it is very believable <laughs> ladies and gentlemen alex Majelton tweeted uh. earlier this week that i opened a complete set of our listen i do the best i, I can i can't even take this story seriously I do the best I can. well i opened a complete set of our devastation in a treasure chest on magic online and was really excited for a brief moment until i found out it's not redeemable anymore and i can't sell it to a bot for more than six tickets the entire wow. set the whole set for that's, six tickets that's and then god bless bbd gross. or um brian brown doing coming on that one and saying well it is called hour of devastation <laughs> The only cards uh, from the set that are worth more than a ticket are Nimble Obstructionist, the Scarab God, and Hollow One. Apparently, yeah. that's pretty much it. And uh, so you get your six ticket, you know, sets or whatever these days. That's exciting and awkward. Yeah, you yeah. Just, you know, back in the day, way back in the day, it used to have a huge set redemption window, and it wouldn't cost you an extra twenty dollars. It would just cost you five dollars for shipping. So if you had the whole set, you could turn it in. You could give them five bucks, and suddenly you got a set of magic cards, and that was really cool. And people honestly abused the living crap out of that, and that's why they got rid of it. But either way, there was definitely a heyday in which this was a huge prize that would have gotten him hundreds of dollars. And nowadays, oh, yeah. it's like, eh, well, here's your six tickets, buddy. Have fun with that. Our devastation, indeed. Too bad. All right, so it is it is awkward to see what happens when board games and magic collide. Okay? Oh, boy. The board game world, here's how the board game world works. Everything's random, and nothing comes out on time, ever. Yeah, right. It's the just, fact that we have a set schedule where we know when sets are coming out is... Is amazing. Unique in Magic. Is very, very... Like, only the biggest... Like, only the Pokemons and the Yu-Gi-Oh's have anywhere close to this type of organization where they can tell you on date X you're going to get Y product. Because stuff just happens in board games. Things are on ships and they're stuck in customs. And so-and-so had a problem at the factory. And what happened to this thing? Or there's a backup in production. Like, everything goes wrong, like, all all the time board games are really weird as a cottage industry and so whiz kids were like hey we're going to do this heroes of dominaria game we're going to do a euro game themed on dominaria and we're going to have these miniatures in there and you're going to have super sweet painted ones or whatever if you want it's the premium version and yada 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 and it's delayed and no one has said anything about it it used to have a release date of july to august which is bad enough by the way that's not even very good but it looks like a december release maybe hopefully and let me tell you guys, that's bad. That's yeah. seriously bad. Magic is not the game at which you can miss a release date and like catch up. Because yeah. when you throw that out in the middle of A, the holidays, and B, we're in Ravnicaville, and we're going to talk about how we're going to be in Ravnica Allegiance in a few weeks by the time this thing comes out, I'm, I'm, I just feel like a lot of that ship has sailed, and I'm yeah. really concerned about this product now being you know working at cool stuff we're selling board games i'll do my best to make sure you guys see the product and i represent it as best i possibly can but wow this timing thing is a serious problem yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, Magic just keeps shooting themselves in the foot when it comes to not just actual Magic the Gathering releases. And this is just another example of it. This is going to be after we're already waist deep in Ravnica stuff. No one's going to care about Heroes of Dominaria. Yeah, it's just, it's going to be tough. And again, I hope, I hope it doesn't, you know, I hope it does a lot better than I'm expecting it to be. Uh, that's That's my hope at this point, because... When you set yourself up for this type of thing, then they're easy. It's it's the easiest scapegoat in the world to be like, look, board games don't work for Magic. Well, maybe if they were released, you know, around the set that they were supposed to be in, that yeah. would have had a, an impact. That would have been part of the hype. Like Dominaria's hype was unbelievable. So you kind of miss that, you know. Okay, move on here to splash damage, and unfortunately, it is not of the positive variety. Uh, Close to me, unfortunately, just a few hours away in Jacksonville, there was a shooting at a Madden event, which was awful because it was live streamed and you can hear the gunshots yeah. and the screaming and it's just, it's bad. You can even see the laser, um, the, yeah, the laser as it goes across his chest. And that's, I mean, that's, it is as real and as horrible and horrifying as it gets. And, uh, and obviously nothing but, uh, you know, love and sympathy to the families of the victims. Uh, two people had, were killed and 11 were injured. And uh, so one of the cool, well, one of the best things about uh, working for cool stuff is that there's never a time in which we haven't more or less said, hey, if we can give back, let's totally give back. And it's great to have, to be part of an organization that can do that. Because, and I'm gonna bring it up here for you guys. Uh, we have a store, Cool Stuff Games has a store in Jacksonville, and we are going to do a charity event, and that is coming up on Saturday, September 1st, and we're going to do raffles all day, we're going to do free prizes, play mats, and promos, all the event entries are going to be given to the GoFundMe for the two victims and their families, uh, and uh, it's just a little something I think we can do in order to help out, uh, you know, Eli Clayton's family as well as Taylor Robinson's family. So, yeah. yeah, this was devastating to to read about. I was at she, I was actually at the mall that day. I went I went shopping and kind of treated myself because I started this new job. And I remember I was on the bus home and I I was I was looking through Twitter and one of the moments had come up and I had seen it. And there was just nobody that wasn't affected by this. You know, I follow some board game people and I follow some some fighting games people and some miniatures people. And just there were, you know, we as, as a gamer family, as just gamers in general, were sort of uniting under that under that banner and, and talking about how terrible it was. And, you know, and I hate to say it, I I have had the thought of like, what would we do? Like if we yeah. were at an open and someone walked in the door, like we would we be going under tables? Would there be deck boxes exploding? I, I had those visions in my head of God forbid what would happen. And so it did lead to wizards of course made a statement as well. And it did lead to some people saying, hey, you know, other events have talked about what they're going to do for security. People have wondered, you know, is this going to lead to an increase in our security? And it's just been, it's unfortunately a nightmare scenario that we've all had to consider. And I had people even responding to my tweet, Callie Anderson, who we know from Star City Games, you know, she talked about how we in America have active shooter training, like at our workplaces and how she remembers you know, the, the the run, fight, hide or whatever it is. And how, you know, where there was another person who responded to my tweet that was like, when he he said that whenever he goes to an event, he mentally looks for the exit. He yeah. mentally just starts taking kind of a, an assessment of the things going on around him. And this is just sort of our reality now. And it's just, uh, it's terrible. It's, um, it's, first of all, it's absolutely ridiculous that it's our reality. Um, you know, all politics aside, there is logistical issues that you literally just cannot put every human that is in a space through a metal detector. It's yeah. the same reason you can't put metal detectors in schools. I'm sorry, guys, there's just too many kids. There's just too many of them. And to try to put a bottleneck on stuff like that just doesn't work. And this happened at a pizza place, for God's sake. Like, you want to go through metal detectors to go hang out at Pizza Hut? Like, come on, man. Like, yeah. you got to be reasonable with, with how all this stuff works. Um, and this also kind of tied into a little bit of just even BBD's article of this was, you know, the, the shooter was somebody who was there to compete. And and, yeah. and didn't do well and and didn't channel that properly at all. And so that led to a lot of discussions about when gaming is a meritocracy and there's so much put into how well you do. And if you lose something, you feel like you lost a part of yourself. You feel like you've lost value. And so, you know, whether or not, and I think that's more of an incentive to not have your worth tied to your results, because that way, if you do lose, you're still you, you, you haven't lost anything. You haven't, you know, become less of a person. And maybe if we didn't have that weight in terms of our successes and our results, maybe that, that wouldn't have happened. Yeah. And it just, and, and you know, the onion gets to just run back that piece. 
only nation in the world where this happens says how does this keep happening nothing we can do not a thing yeah all right so we'll go from the extreme of one end to the extreme of the other end which is overall there's some the issues new we'll talk about them. glamorous now the new yorker glamorous. itself yes world famous new yorker magazine yeah did an entire write-up on magic the gathering uh they attended gp vegas it's you know which we were there with them at some mm-hmm. point uh have a bunch of interviews with people all over the spectrum of the magic community we were too busy doing our live show with mark rosewater in the front row. right we just, yeah. you know yeah. we, we had things and their people didn't talk to our people so um <sighs> So that was the thing, but uh, but regardless, you know, sort of given you know where Magic's been, it's twenty five years, how it got here, sort of where it's supposed to be going, and uh, unfortunately, it's weird. And and this is something that the professor Brian, the professor of the Tolarian Community College, mentioned was like, man, they talked to him for an hour, and they took out like maybe a mid couple minutes yeah. worth of talking that didn't always put him in the best light which is kind of awkward. Yeah, yeah, that quote was weird. And then the professor had to do, uh, you know, the professor wanted to explain himself and then he kind of fell into the trap that some people often fall into is that, you know, uh, you know, writers sometimes choose bites. They don't necessarily post the entire paragraph and things get lost in context. And, you know, when he kind of elaborated as to, this is really how the conversation went, you know, there are some people that were like, all right, girl, you're at the point where you need to start recording your interviews because people are, you know, can do this. And it's unfortunate, but it, it, it does happen. I mean, let's just take this one, for example, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about. Uh, they're interviewing uh, the professor and he says, you know, I have more people subscribed to me than Wizards of the Coast has subscribed to them. He said, brushing his shoulder length hair back behind his ears. The actual company that makes the game has less pull with people than I do, and they hate me for it like that. That comes off bad. That it comes does. off really bad. But, you know, the prof and his charm and the way he speaks and the way he's sort of emoting, you can get gist of things. You can understand the way he's kind of crafting that message. But if it's just flat on the page, you know, from an hour yeah. interview. This is why jokes don't work in a courtroom. When, whenever, anytime that there's a joke that happens and it's read back from the transcript, it's like, on, on August 22nd, did you say to mm. the waitress, uh, this joke, and then it's like read in a super deadpan way. That's exactly the same way here. It just does not, you know, sarcasm and nuance and and inflection and tone don't translate well. And prof is a lot of unspoken uh, uh, in. Um, um, well, he's a YouTuber, you know, he's yeah. used to sort of projecting, assuming that you can see him and, and, and see his gestures and see his facial expressions. And it's kind of the thing, one of the things we struggle with is, you know, we do some, we do an audio version of the show, but sometimes, you know, one of us will have a facial expression and it won't carry over and the joke won't land or Evan will even have to say, you know, oh, for the folks listening at home who can't see this, right. here's what you're missing by not watching the video. And so I understand that. Right. Absolutely. So uh, that said, you can also go check out uh, his one of his new videos talking about how uh, you know, so sort of sell out. It is and, so fun. <laughs> and there's levels of points that you can get, you know, for, uh, you know, for being a shill or your shill. It points. really was a master class and sort of like being tongue in cheek and kind of laughing at, at your critics, if you will. You know, he's one of the people who always gets accused of and he, he always has scathing commentary for wizards. He doesn't let them get away with anything and God bless him for it. But, you know, you can sit there and you can say, oh, God. God, you know, people are saying these things about me. They're so untrue. It's so unfair. Or you can make a video about it and just have a really good time. And that was just sort of a master class, pun intended. I guess he's the professor in terms of how to deal with that sort of thing. And right. yeah, the, Regardless uh, of how the professor came off in this New Yorker article, I thought the article was great. Yes. Uh, Nama Nama Jamroni uh, 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 wrote an article about D and D last year. Uh, appears to be the the plug in at New York at the New Yorker for and all the illustrations the were gold. Wizards oh, of the Coast related. So the illustrations um, were so good. So the illustrations good. are hilarious. I want to play Matt of of this big group of people <laughs> at the very top here. I really liked the line. There was a there was a table setting of like five players in a row, and somebody was like, "Tag yourself." You know, there was the one that was like in yep. the tank. There was the one that was kind of cocky. There was the one that was like, mm, you know, with that killer hand and being kind of weird. And it was there's the yeah. one that just looks like Jeremy Knoll. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's just Noel. like. Pleasant dude playing magic, grinning yeah. next to Cassius Marsh, and it's like, oh, Jeremy's just playing magic with Cassius. It's just hanging out. Yeah. And, and to go back to the the professor's video just for a second, you know, I've I've been in the game quite a bit, not like the game of magic, you know, just the, the the making stuff game, and 
I got this way back in the day. Uh, you, th- you think I didn't hear this after I got to go to the Invitational and I got to interview the right. R&D members? Like suddenly, suddenly I had lost all ability to be objective about magic. Like I put Wizards on blast all the time. Yeah, like, of course. And Wizards sometimes is like, hey, Evan, wow, did you really have to say, you know, like that? Oh, yeah. And I'm like, like, I, like to this day, I still, because I, I have a really hard time saying Chris Cox without laughing. And every time Trick catches word of that, I get a message to him saying, Rose are disrespectful to you that way. And so, yeah, we get, we, we give as well as we get, trust me. Right. <laughs> What's the last time we were on the, on the homepage? We haven't been uh, on there in a while. It's, it's been uh, a minute. I mean, but, you I don't know. think they like us much anymore. <laughs> I mean, I know one time I, I I said something like, you know, I can't hear you from the sound of all this money. And they're like, did you really have to put it that way? And I'm like, well, you know, <sighs> so no, I calls them as no, I, I see them. I calls them as I sees them. And we don't have time for it um, at, this week, but go check out Frank Carson's article on what if the modern four of limit was, re- was, re- was removed. It's I just want, brilliant. I just want to be in his mind. Oh my God. I just want to see how the the, the synapses <clears throat> connect in his brain. Yeah, he is he is quite quite the dude. Um, but I had him on my show too at one point. He's so funny. Oh my yeah. god, and he's he's yeah. smart. He's articulate. Yes, he, he's interesting. I mean, like, and still like just loves what he does. Like he plays Affinity like I play Dredge, and he's been playing Affinity for much longer. And just mm-hmm. you know, you'd think after at some point you would just not maybe just fall out of love with your deck, but just just really the picture of doing what you love to do, you know, and, and just, he loves affinity when it's good, loves it when it's bad, you know, and, and it's just sort of the person you want to look to if you want to, you know, if you wonder, you know, can I just yep. play the deck I love forever? You sure can. If you've <laughs> got something ridiculous to think about, yeah. hashtag someone call Frank Karsten. That's right. <laughs> well, congratulations to Jesse P from Endicott, New York. Congrats. You are our winner of the $50 gift certificate to coolstuffinc.com. Thanks, Cool Stuff, for providing that. That's always fun. Go find you fifty dollars worth of awesome things. Uh, pre-order Guilds of Ravnica. I don't. I, I'm not saying that when Wizards changes up the ability to have direct purchasing is going to affect how you're able to get booster boxes. But I'm just going to tell you, if you want a booster box of Guilds of Ravnica for real, pre-order it wherever you want to pre-order it. Get it from LGS so you get the buy a box. <coughs> Good hint. Pre-order it. I'm just telling you. Um, also, going through here. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. Um, wanted to note that we have uh, Chris RD19 subscribed via Prime. Thanks very much. House Excellent. Of Sh- Thank you. Thank you for Amazon's dollars. We'll take all of Amazon's dollars. <laughs> sure. They got plenty. House of Shadow resubscribed for four months. Thank you very wow. much. Uh, Michael Sean 09 subscribed via Prime. Uh, Argent Griever gave us 500 bits, which we appreciate. Wow. Thank you. Blazing Disciple is now resubscribed via Prime for four months. Thanks much. Thank uh, Chalice Drea has subscribed via prime which is awesome windbag865 gave us some bits jesus cheesiest i think it is has subscribed via prime to the rumor that the elder dragon can reproduce through parthenogenesis like oh. like godzilla you're Good welcome job. you're welcome <laughs> Then the pregnant mama train kept rolling when the art from a Guilds of Ravnica booster box shows Vraska the Gorgon Planeswalker with a little JC baby bump showing through. Maybe. We're not sure. Sure. Well, we're all This is how rumors start. It is. It really is. It's true. Um, Because I heard you talking stuff about Vraska in front of my mama, and that's not true. Right. (laughs) All right. Um, We're all on board the baby train, so which one of Magic's characters do you want to see get knocked up next, Ruben? Well, of all of the planeswalkers that have graced the pages of people's most eligible planeswalkers, I think the best future parent is probably Garrick. Hmm. He's the right man to be a single dad, what with the solitary lifestyle, those powerful childbearing hips that you see in all the arts, and also as his lack of being in any recent magic set because he's really good at playing hide and seek. Oh, wow. <laughs> Speak no, whatever, see no Garrick. Sure. Right. Aaron? Well, among Magic's sexiest spellcasters, I think the one best suited to a baby bump is Lord Wingrace from the new Commander sets. Partly because he's one of the only trust characters I trust who uses the graveyard, partially because he's super powerful, but also because it's a full litter of potential Planeswalker kitty babies, and that is a pride we can all be proud of. Very nice. Well, clearly the best character to become a future baby mama is Liliana Vess. Because if I've learned anything in my decade and a half of parenthood, it's that the most important tool in my toolbox is making sure my kids are absolutely terrified I'll eat their brains if they don't do their chores. <laughs> Hashtag five zombies. Great. Yes. Lovely. Yes. yes, yes. That That's is, life in the Irwin household. Let me tell you. 
But that ends another live episode of Magic Mics. Thanks for joining us here to discuss all things magic. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for having me. And thank you, everybody, for bearing with us with our technical difficulties. We do appreciate you. Yeah, which is great. Thank you, Ruben. Thanks, Zoom.us, and also all of you for joining us this weekend. Call us, Zoom, call us. We'd like to work with you. We can do right. this. We can make it for you. It's been great. Call us on Skype, and we'll talk with you. Wow. God. Shots fired. Well, we move to our final slide, as I want to thank our sponsor, CoolStuffInc.com, our co-sponsor, CardHoarder.com, my co-hosts, Aaron Campbell and Ruben Bressler. You guys were watching or listening, and I hope you support us at Patreon.com slash Magic Mics. Please follow, like, tweet, favorite, share, subscribe to everything social that tells people we exist. Catch us online at Twitch.tv at Magic Mics, on Twitter at Magic Mics Cast, our Magic Mics subreddit, and like the Magic Mics page on Facebook. Talk to us privately at Magic Mics Podcast at gmail.com. Follow the audio-only podcast at Magic Mics Podcast at Libsyn.com, or find us on iTunes, or join us here next week. Same time, same place, for another episode of Magic Mics. Good night, everybody.